you find the strongest person in your life at the weakest moment in theirs. What do you do? Let's talk about that with Marigolds by Eugenia Collier today. You destroy them. No, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you should forgive them. <laughs> what kind of a coming age story would that be? <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I will break your heart crypto. <laughs> All right, we got a lovely little 1969 piece for you here today. And uh, I just want to start out talking about the pros, man. Oh, oh, it was good writing. Like things like where they'd say, but memory is an abstract painting. It does not present things as they are, but rather how they feel. I was like, oh, that's where Maya Angelou got that from. <laughs> Yeah, I love some of the character development of this, of the main character. And it they use some keywords in there like hate, you know, and like I always kind of cringe with hate. But you feel those children's hatred towards the flowers in this story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't even just like the the memories were compared to cobwebs. Everything is dusty except for these beautiful flowers. Like it, there's there's just really a striking image that this author is able to convey, I feel like in very few words. Well, we're getting most of this story right from a single perspective of Lizbeth. And do you think she's a, a trustworthy narrator? It seems like sometimes we got some conflicting information from her about, you know, her recall of specific events throughout the story. Well, there's, there's multiple ways an unreliable narrator can be introduced, right? There's those that are lying to you on purpose, withholding information. And then there's those that, Maybe they don't know themselves. And I think this is maybe more of that scenario, right? She doesn't remember, was there five? Was there six people on the day they beheaded the marigolds? Like, the memories all flow together like watercolors. Again, the beautiful prose writing. I think, I think this speaks to when we look back, we might change things or view things or have problems remembering things that have impacted us in this past. And she's trying to recall something that was very impactful for her, right? Like the, the setting of the story is the Great Depression, right? We're, we're looking back when we were younger during the Great Depression, where, where Elizabeth was younger and growing up in the shanty towns of, of Maryland, right? Yeah, and I think that when you have all those emotions evoked in you and you're going through some tragedy like the Great Depression, kind of like we experience nowadays, I think that maybe your memories are skewed because time seems to kind of flow different during those tragedies. And it's probably a coping mechanism as we see uh, Elizabeth trying to cope with these new emotions and feelings that are happening as a result of her character development through the story. Well, in terms of feelings, it definitely feels empty, right? They, they describe how everything's dusty and arid, but the one beautiful thing are those dang marigolds. That's the one thing that she recalls, <laughs> right? And it's also a specific children time. hated those marigolds. <laughs> well, and it's also worth pointing out, it was a very specific time where she was neither woman nor child, right? This is, I think, in the realm of coming of age story. For sure. So Liz Elizabeth, her brother, Joey, who was three years younger and a group of five or six kids, decided to go bug Miss Lottie one day. They head to her garden and start just chucking pebbles, right? Kind of innocent, fun things till Miss Lottie comes out. And that's when Elizabeth kind of runs up and then, starts chanting at her, right? So it's, it's all very juvenile is what I would say. And I think maybe Miss Lottie might've been pretty upset, <laughs> but it's, it's that night. I think Elizabeth has her, I would call her epiphany, her coming of age moment where they go to bed and she hears her father just sobbing, right? Maybe, maybe the strongest man in her life, you know, our parents are infallible to see him in this weekend emotional state being upset about not being able to provide for his family during the, the Great Depression and, and the racism that's going on for people of color at the time in America. And it upsets her, right? And I think children might have a hard time expressing these feelings, expressing the anger. She doesn't know what to do, so she kind of you know, wakes up early in the morning, wakes her brother up, and they go over to go destroy Miss Lottie's marigolds, right? The only beautiful thing in this town, the thing that mocks what could be better, right? The only way to make everything just the same, so therefore we don't know what's beautiful, is just to destroy these flowers. So that's what she goes out and does. That's when Miss Lottie kind of comes out and catches her, and she just, the description on her face is, is very powerful because they talk about her looking like she's given up. 
I love this almost like a perfect blending of two themes of the age of innocence and the coming of age of Elizabeth. And that this, in that moment of, I think, clarity of, like you said, of when she realizes that she has left childhood things behind, she says in the story, I quote, I scrambled to my feet and just stood there and stared at her. And there was a moment when childhood faded and womanhood began. That violent, crazy act was the last act of childhood. And you really feel like she's grown up and that this violent act kind of this violent act broke something in her of destroying the one beautiful thing that the town had. So why do you think Lottie did it? Why destroy the one beautiful thing the town had? I think she was looking internally. Um, I think that she doesn't know how to express herself. Uh, that goes along with the idea of innocence. I don't think that she knows what compassion is. She doesn't understand how to deal with her feelings towards her parents and maybe their failure of providing something beautiful for her. Uh, and then she sees somebody else and she's jealous of that. And she lashes out through violence of, you know, the only no way that she knows how to deal with an emotion that she's unfamiliar with. Children have like this strange antagonistic side to them. I mean, we all know those children. They don't mean to be terrible people, right? Like, I don't think anyone thinks a child's trying to be a terrible person, but they there's definitely... There's a little snot sometimes. <laughs> there, there, there's a little antagonistic side of them, right? And they, they even talk about this John Burke. We made a game of thinking of ways to disturb John Burke and then to elude his violent retribution. Like, these kids know <laughs> the retribution from kids is what comes afterwards, right? And it's they almost push like... push the buttons. <laughs> yeah, and so when her father is upset, and that makes her upset because the only perfect being in her life is crying and vulnerable, she just lashes out, right? She just goes out, just whoosh, takes out the flowers. And I think the important part is, how does she feel after destroying those flowers? Well, she feels guilty. I, I want to go back real quick, though. I love your idea on class commentary because flowers would be a luxury that immediately says wealthier than others because if you're struggling you worry about food you're not worried about you know making beautifications to your house so yeah nailed it right on the head there but i i think that she's she's upset right i mean at herself to realize that she has done something wrong and i think that's her you know coming of age part is that she knows that this was not right and she shouldn't have done it I think the narrator makes that clear too, because we have a quote where it says, I was running as if the Furies were after me, as perhaps they were. So do you know what the Furies are? The Furies, the spirits of vengeance. No. They are. Actually, they are. No, no, they <laughs> oh, okay. are. They, they... Okay, okay. I thought, I thought so. I didn't know if I was right. It's from Greek mythology. They punished you for wrongdoings in a sense. I've learned something from you over these years. <laughs> <laughs> so she's being chased by guilt is one way to look at that. And she talks about, as soon as she destroys them, suddenly I was ashamed, and I did not like being ashamed. And you'll notice, this is what's interesting, when when she first went out there with the kid, the five or six kids, and they're picking on her, and they yelled at her, the old lady witch, they, they picture this witch face on her. And I think that speaks to how children are still fantasizing, right? Children imagine, they, they dress things up. And if we take this as a coming of age, right? She's no longer child, no longer woman. You'll notice at this point, they talk about how Miss Lottie's witch face fades away. And instead they see the woman finally. And Miss Lottie never plants marigolds again. So with her witch face going away and finally seeing people as they are, to me, this was kind of the coming of age talk where her fantasies are going away and she's starting to face reality. Kind of the quote that I, I really liked was, whatever verb there was left in her, whatever was of love and beauty and joy that had not been squeezed out by life had been there in the marigolds she so had tenderly cared for. Mm, oh, yeah. like yeah. that indirect and direct characterization of both Elizabeth and Miss Lottie is, is, is incredible. So good. Yeah. Well, and it's also kind of the, the children or the flowers. Like that's what we have to plant and put our energy for is, is the future, right? We're, we're trying to make better children, better flowers, a world, a better place to be. That's what these represented to me. And to come along and take that way, well, then that takes away their purpose. It takes away their goal in life and just leaves them empty. And I think that's kind of why this is her coming of age is she 
You'll notice, one, Miss Lottie gives up. She never plants again because her, her hope is destroyed at this point. But I think that's what finally gives our narrator a chance, Elizabeth, to finally grow as a character. And I think that's why she starts to plant. Okay, okay, I got, I got one for you. And this is a little bit of a stretch, I think. But you, you said empty, and you talk about the changing of Miss Lottie and Elizabeth. And I know there's not a lot here, but hear me out, all right? Marigolds sometimes can represent the flowers of the dead or death. What if this is the death of Miss Lottie's compassion and love and the birth of Lisbeth into womanhood and learning compassion? I think it the is. Marigolds. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. I think it okay. is. It's a, it's, <laughs> yes, score one for me <laughs> with the flowers. <laughs> it's, well, and it's very complex because on top of this, we can't talk, we, we can't forget about the Great Depression that was going on and how these families felt pressure, right, to provide for their families, to find hope because that's all they had left to hang on to in some cases. And you have the quotes where they say things like, poverty was the cage in which we were all trapped and our hatred of it was still the vague undirected restlessness of the zoo bred flamingo who knows that nature created him to fly free. Right. I think that talks about hope. It talks about, you know, whenever we talk about fly, flying can be a way of escaping limitations of escaping boundaries. Right. And these children are trapped by this environment, trapped by their economy, by their situation, that what's the way that they can potentially get out of it. Right. And I think that's, that's kind of that idea of hope and never letting go of that dream, whether it be investing into your children, into your flowers, to bettering your community, that sort of thing. I feel really bad for kind of both in this story. And that's kind of unusual, right? Because, I don't know, you're, you're, you're mad at Elizabeth for destroying something, but then, like, Miss Lottie was, you know, was she holding, was she lording this over people a little bit, maybe? Like, you shouldn't do that in, in such a poor area, you know, kind of that economic vibe. But at the very end, I felt like, both learn something about themselves through this act of destruction. I think Kaliar spun a very fun story. We will spin up a playlist down below for other talks on her. If you're looking to hear more from us in the future, I think, I think this was a, a good little story. So I definitely would recommend checking it out and feel free to leave a little flower emoji. If you made it this far in the video and want to help support us guys, we appreciate your time today. We post videos every Monday and Thursday with bonus videos on Tuesdays. If having discussions about literature is something that you find interesting, we'd appreciate you hitting that subscribe button to join us. Una out. Peaceful flowers. <laughs>